Welcome to OECD Podcast, where policy meets people. Machine learning, or artificial intelligence, can be traced back to the 1950s, but really leapt forward in the last decade or so, thanks to more powerful computing. Some place their hopes in it to solve complex problems quickly or help people to work more effectively. Digital platforms from Facebook to Netflix use AI to work out what users want or to make games more challenging. AI is at the wheel when it comes to driverless cars and is used by farmers to monitor crops and the police to solve crime. It has promise in healthcare too, including to better detect COVID-19. With such benefits, what's not to like about AI? Well, there are quite a few concerns actually, in part because of AI's strength and also because we too are learning about its potential. Could AI go too far as machines teach machines and even learning human emotions and tastes yet with very little control by human beings? AI is already replacing jobs, but could AI even end up outsmarting people altogether as the great Stephen Hawking warned? Policymakers are now taking AI seriously to safeguard public interests and to develop AI sensibly as well as intelligently. I'm Robin Davis, and you're listening to OECD Podcasts. There are many questions we'll be asking about AI in this podcast. How can AI technologies help in the health emergency? What role can it play in finding a vaccine? How can AI help the economic recovery? And what can we do to make sure that AI is trustworthy as we rebuild? A little later in the podcast, we'll hear from Kathleen Walsh of Cognolytica and Jack Clark of OpenAI. But first, Shane McLaughlin caught up with Audrey Plunk, head of OECD Digital Economy Policy Division, to tell us a little more about what AI is and why it's fast becoming such a burning public policy issue. Thank you so much to Audrey Plunk for joining us today on OECD Podcast to discuss the role of artificial intelligence during the current COVID-19 crisis. So we've seen that during the crisis, there's been a real great digital acceleration and digital technologies such as artificial intelligence being used to combat the global pandemic. So Audrey, what are some of the ways that AI is being used in the current COVID-19 health emergency? Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Well, as you say, in response to the pandemic, technologies as a whole have played an important role in responding and recovering. But specifically to AI applications and how they've helped to fight the pandemic at different stages, we look in four main areas. The first is how AI has helped to detect the virus, diagnose the virus, and help people know what the status of their situation is with regard to the virus. The second is for AI to help prevent or slow the virus's spread by doing predictive modeling around contagion, by helping to uh, surveil and trace where virus outbreaks have come. The third area is in helping us respond specifically by looking for, for example, a vaccine for um, helping people use technology in their daily lives. And then finally, AI is being employed in the recovery to improve early warning tools, to improve um, our understanding of the future and how um, the virus might move forward. How are you at the OECD helping to to build awareness, um, particularly with policymakers and the role that AI can play in the crisis and in the recovery? So in terms of data, we've developed a COVID-19 tracker um, with live data on coronavirus-related research publications. The tracker allows you to follow COVID-19 news and events as they happen. It can be filtered by country, and one can track the evolution of the pandemic by country. Another stream of work in terms of of data is coronavirus-related research, and there's obviously an explosion over the past few months. Uh, We explore collaboration within and between countries and institutions there. So we've heard about the importance of AI in the crisis, but how can we make AI safe um, regarding data and privacy, but as well, you know, in, in terms of transparency and being trustworthy for all actors? Well, the OECD AI principles can give a sense of direction and coherence to a policy area that is still very nascent and holds many difficult ethical issues. 
This was the driving force behind their development back in 2019, which seems like a long time ago now. Policy tends to, to lag behind technology and we see a huge amount of effort to get ahead of it right now. Within the context of national policies, a few important areas that we, we, we tend to focus governments on and um, they're reflected in our AI recommendations, but they include things like investing in AI research and development. This is, is critically important and most of the national strategies that we look at have some element of this. Um, fostering a digital ecosystem for AI, uh, shaping and enabling a policy environment for AI. So, you know, this can include a wealth of existing uh, and related uh, policy topics such as uh, data privacy or cybersecurity, um, just to name a couple. Uh, building human capacity and preparing for labor market transformation. So the question of how I, AI will change how people work and how people live is, is extremely important. Um, and then finally, international cooperation for trustworthy AI. And so we've seen a significant amount of work around the world to try to understand that. Some people call it ethics, some people call it responsible AI, trustworthy AI, but essentially we're trying to get to this question of, um, since it is so global and our interconnected systems are so interdependent, can we build common notions of what it means to build trustworthy and cooperative AI? And those are, you know, some examples of where countries have been uh, moving and where we see a lot of attention, rightly probably so, is around how do we explain these systems to people? How do we audit them? How can we make them transparent? And what what does accountability look like? Is it strict legal accountability? Are there other ways of holding actors accountable? And then who in the supply chain are you holding accountable? Is it you know, the, the coder, the, the algorithm development, the data source, the platform designer, you know, the implementer at the end. So it's a complex ecosystem and there's a significant amount of cooperation and learning that can be done by working together at an intergovernmental and international level. Let's turn our attention um, to the issue of, of data and dig down on data a little bit. Why is privacy such a big issue with AI and when we're talking about artificial intelligence and is is this more important than with other types of technology for example well I think I mean, privacy is I think becoming more important uh, as technology becomes just more integrated into everything that we do and as uh, we have more devices that generate more data and more data that is transmitted over a a network in a digital format that can be used for different things. So I think people around the world, world are starting to become more knowledgeable and understanding of um, how data are generated and, and, and concerned about where they're going. And I think we saw in, in so many ways, COVID-19 was the perfect test case for, um, and, and I say perfect and not in a positive way, but perfect test case in, in some of the fears that the privacy community and the data protection community has long discussed about, um, about sharing this sort of very personal sensitive data. And so I think there is this concern with regard to COVID specifically and whether or not you have, have a virus, what the government will do with it, how long they will keep it, who it could fall in the hands of uh, in some countries, whether or not you can get medical coverage depends on your state of health. If you're going to use, for example, track and trace technologies to, um, to track and trace the virus, so primarily geolocation data, um, where you are and when, and um, there's lots of scenarios that one has, can imagine, and many people have, of how that kind of information could be misused or used against people. And, and so what can we do to continue to use data, but also assuage these concerns and protect people's um, individual rights? A lot of the policy response to date has been to try to control data, to try to keep it within national boundaries, to try to keep it from being shared. And we, what we really see both with AI and with things like track and trace technologies is that that's a very limiting policy response because uh, in, in reality, if we want to recover from something like COVID, we're going to need to share data across borders. Audrey, I just wanted to ask you why you think people fear AI and the whole issue of regulation and further regulation on AI. Um, will it work? Who should we regulate? Some um, actors say, well, you can never regulate innovators and scientists and those that kind of front of AI. What are your thoughts about regulation and the issue of AI? 
to me, AI is a, is a compilation of, of the history of technology and computing up until the point that we're living in today. And so it's not a, it's not a binary thing. It's not a thing. It's not something you can buy off the shelf. It's a, it's a suite of computing capability that will be used uh, and implemented in, in, and already is, but will continue to be used and implemented in many, many different ways. And so to me, the idea that you can't regulate it or shouldn't regulate it because by definition regulation harms innovation it's an old idea and we have to we have to put it aside it's too important to how we um how we conduct our jobs how we teach our children it's we really need to to regulate it and i think we have to get out of the mindset that regulation has to be a negative thing that it has to be about prohibiting things it has to be about keeping something from happening but think about regulation as an enabler um, as providing um parameters providing confidence providing um a sense of public trust uh, and global trust in how things are used. Just one last question, and to bring it back to the current pandemic, we're all uh, struggling through in so many respects. Um, we've spoken a lot about the role of AI and how we um, approach different technologies and so on. But what would you say are some of the limitations of using AI um, in the current pandemic and then beyond into the recovery? Well, certainly data. I mean, limitations uh, on AI is, you know, on both computing power, how much of it we have and, and what the systems look like and who has access to the computing power, you know, um, that's that's a fun, without that, you, you, you can't train algorithms and you can't feed data into them and so you don't have the output. So you need, you really need the, the foundational, the, the infrastructure, the technology. And then data, and, um, and I think that's why you see us focusing so much on data, both now and in the future at the OECD, because it really is, it's a, not only a factor of production, but it's a, it's a critical resource. As we heard from Audrey Plonk, AI can help us in our COVID-19 recovery, but we must acknowledge the current limitations and need for rules to protect people and enable the technology. And data and transparency are so important. Kathleen Walsh is a principal analyst with Cognolytica, an organization that monitors AI development and in industry. Clara Young spoke to her earlier this year and asked her about how people's own data is being used to train AI and how humans could stay in control of AI. Data is at the heart of AI. The more data you have in general, the better, especially for certain types of learning. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, you need clean, well-labeled data to teach the system what it is that you're learning. So a, an example that people always give is images of cats. Mm -hmm. And you have clean, well-labeled data of cats, and then you keep feeding it into the system and the system then can give you with a certain degree of certainty it's never a hundred percent but it'll give you with a certain degree of certainty that this image that it's never seen is a cat or is not a cat with our personal data it's been used for quite some time so back in you know the early 2000s people freely gave away their data for a variety of things for email for apps for you know, basically anything that you Our could Facebook use. Facebook page. Yeah, right. Facebook. You know, think about everything that you've signed up for. I'm a runner, and I use a running app so that it can track my miles, and it uses GPS. It knows exactly where I am. I mean, it's like a GPS tracker. But I give up some of that privacy so that I can get the benefit of knowing my miles and my pace. I have been hearing though uh, that we may be reaching a point quite soon where uh, humans will find it difficult to understand uh, the decision-making process that an AI system went through, especially if it's a neural network or a deep learning system. What do we do in that case? Yeah, so neural nets are considered black boxes because mm. you can't go back and have traceability. You can't say, okay, I took this step, then this step, then this step, and I got to this decision because of this and trace, trace back. So. You know, these are issues that we're working through. We are trying to build and help pioneer a transparency score so that we can say, okay, well, you know, this algorithm and this model that you built is a three out of 10 in transparency. Well, what exactly does that mean? It's a multi-factor transparency score. So it says, what's my source of data? Do I know it? Um, how often is my data 
you know, retrained or how often do I get new data and what algorithm did I use? Because some algorithms are more explainable than others. Decision trees, for example, they are more easily traceable. Hmm. Neural nets, deep learning, that's a black box. It also comes down to is it okay to not be able to have 100% explainability and transparency? And if the answer is no, don't go with a don't go with an AI. If the answer is yes, say what degree is it okay? And maybe then you have a human go in and do a follow up behind it and say, well, if I was making this decision on my own, I would have done it this way. Maybe it'll agree. Maybe it won't. Hmm. Unknown black boxes. Maybe it will agree. Maybe it won't. Transparency and accountability are key for AI to win people's trust and solve the problems people need solving and to help people do better at work. So what about policymakers? What are they doing? And what should they not do? What kind of rules do we need? Jack Clark is the head of policy at OpenAI. He also spoke with Clara Young. There are many more upsides than, than downsides. And what you probably need to do is align on who's accountable. So if I'm deploying an AI system in a medical case, we do ultimately want a person or an entity to be accountable so that people have access to things like legal recourse if that makes a bad decision. I think a thing that lots of people can get confused about with regard to AI is because the technology is quite new, we sometimes think we need a ton of new regulatory interventions, mm -hmm. but really it's we just need to fit this technology into a lot of our existing stuff because, you know, as you know, liability is sort of a well well understood thing in the law that we've had uh, millions of humans work on for, you know, millions of human years by now. So we don't need to change that up. We just need to find a way to get it to work for us here. The European Commission just came out with a white paper and they pointed out that the reality of AI is that there are certain situations that are not covered by existing legislation on consumer protection or privacy. So is it adaptable to all the situations that AI, that can arise with AI? No. Decision making? There are, there are cases where AI is going to be in places where we don't have sufficient regulations yet. Um, what would these be? Well, I think this is actually a problem. I think it's hard for us to know what these areas are because governments don't have enough capacity to analyze and understand the technology and where it's turning up in society. So in my role on the AI index of the steering committee for that project, I try and work out where AI is being deployed, where AI is being used. Now, it might be surprising to you, but companies don't always be transparent about whether they're using AI at all. I yes, mean, in my experience has been it's difficult to actually find out that information. And so if we want to have a regulatory regime which allows AI to be as beneficial as possible, we need governments to have a lot more awareness of where AI is being deployed in the economy. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem, but we do need to get that basic data in. Oh, there's also uh, the question of the expense of responsible AI, because first, how would you define um, a trustworthy AI system? What are, what are the characteristics? I think they're pretty similar to a trustworthy company or a trustworthy government. They have processes that are well documented and usually somewhat public so that you can audit how they make decisions. You may not know the particulars of, in the same way you might not know the particulars of how a government has conversations about how to deal with a tense situation, you may not know exactly how an AI system reasons about how to deal with a situation, but you will know the process which it uses to, to perform that reasoning. In the same way you know that if uh, a government is faced with an issue, there's a process by which the government gathers information, consults people, and makes a decision. So we need transparency into things like that. The additional thing is we need a new set of incentives, I think, in society. So something implicit in your question, um, and please push back if you think I'm, I'm overselling your position, is... Why aren't we having more good stuff happen with AI? You know, why, you know, why are people like so nervous about this? And I'd, I'd say to you that we need governments to actually work on creating better incentives for sort of beneficial AI systems to occur, because a lot of this comes down to things like commercial incentives, frankly, right. and right. we haven't made it attractive or incentivize these companies to do many more societally beneficial things. And that's why people have anxieties around the technology. I've been hearing a lot about the problem with data, that there's not enough of it or it's not good enough. 
could you explain to us what's the difference between good data and bad data and what's representative and what's not representative? And what are the, what are the consequences of bad data? Something that we should think about, about the difference between good data and bad data, it's really representation. A lot of data seems good to me because I'm well represented in it, because people usually have had an economic incentive to make it work well for people like me. But if I was someone from a different demographic or speaking with a radically different accent, AI systems wouldn't recognize me, they wouldn't understand me, they wouldn't be able to decode what I say. And that can give you an idea of how that would feel terribly unrepresentative to me and my experience of these AI systems would be bad. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do to make sort of fairer data sets is look at who the system is, is actually being deployed, deployed to benefit, and then try and make sure they're represented in the data set. So new rules, maybe not, but training AI not to repeat old biases, to make it neutral, trustworthy, and to keep people in the driving seat so that we run AI and not, as the late Stephen Hawking feared, have it superseding humans. The OECD AI Observatory is working to help make sure that AI does not evolve alone and keeps the human touch. To find out more, go to www.oecd.ai. I'm Robin Davis. Thank you for listening. To listen to other OECD podcasts, find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and soundcloud.com OECD.